Take heart because Jesus is coming back. Amen? <laughs> Amen. So, hello, my name is Charlie Painter. I'm the executive director here, and I'm filling in for Pastor Willie while he's on sabbatical, who is back from their trip around the, the, the country. So, he's sitting over there. Don't bother him. He's on sabbatical. Don't, he's sitting right there. Make sure you leave him alone. Don't ask for prayer or anything. He's right there. So, <laughs> You can ask him for prayer, just nothing else ministry related. You have to come to me first. So, <laughs> so welcome, um, and I'm, I'm so glad you can join us. Happy Mother's Day, and I have to say I'm so glad that last week's message did not fall on Mother's Day. That would have been so awkward. If you were here, you know. If you know, you know. But uh, today, we have an, uh, another interesting passage, how we, how we go through Scripture here, how we preach through a passage. We go verse by verse, and uh, we don't skip anything. So where the passage falls on a certain week is where we do it. So we don't try to tailor it to a certain week. So I was thinking, as I was coming up on this passage, how do I make this about Mother's Day? It's about uh, the dead rising in Christ when Jesus' return comes. How does that become about Mother's Day? And I, I, I kind of posed that to all of you at the end of the service last week. It's like, how do I do that? And I, I, people approached me and said, it's so relevant in our church right now. This is exactly what the church needs to hear. And it, it's a somber thing, but also an encouraging and, and great thing that it, it's amazing how God works these things out. Even when, you know, I'm here just, you know, there, that's what we're doing. It, it's, it, God is like, I, I know what I'm doing. I, I know how we're handling it. So uh, let's open in prayer and we'll get into the passage. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. We thank you for the word that you have to, to speak to us today, Lord. We, we thank you for this book that you wrote to the, the Thessalonians, Lord, and how it's so relevant to us, Lord, and how it's here to encourage us through hard times and, and, um, and just show us that you have a plan. You, you have a plan for those of us who have passed away, Lord, and, and the encouragement that, that is there for us who are still here, Lord. I pray that you would speak through me, through this message, Lord. I pray for everyone and uh, who is listening, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fill them so that they can hear your words. And Lord, I just pray that you'd bless this um, sermon in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so just to catch you up, if you haven't uh, been here for the rest of the series, uh, this is First Thessalonians. It's Paul writing to the Thessalonians, and uh, he got a re good report from Timothy. And now we're on the part of the book where he's, uh, Timothy is saying, the Thessalonians are doing good, and here's some things in their theology that we could, they could use some help with. There, there's some things they didn't understand, because Paul was with them for such a short amount of time. They got the basics down, but there's some things that could be shored up. So this is the part of the book where Paul is writing to the Thessalonians saying, okay, I got the report from Timothy. I understand there's some things you're unclear on. Here are some of the, the clarifications I have for you to make it clear. And in today's passage, it's all about Jesus' return and what that means for the believers who have passed away before he returns. And uh, that's the, the name of the passage, because Jesus is coming back. Last week's uh, message was called Keep Yourself Clean. It was the awkward uh, um, passage. And keep yourself clean because Jesus is coming back. And that's what we have to look forward to. So um, this is really, you could tell this is Paul's heart. Like he's really excited at this part of the book. You could tell he's been anxious to get here. Because you, we, we've looked through the previous passages, uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3. He ends every single chapter mentioning Jesus' return. In, in chapter 1, he says, and to wait, in verse 10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Wait for his Son from heaven. Jesus is coming back. Uh, uh, 1, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Not you. That was the passage we talked about a couple weeks ago where Jesus is coming back and we, we have our cards that we're going to present to him. That, hey, these are the people that I shared the gospel with. These are the people I ministered to. These are my crowns that I pre I'm presenting before you at your return. And then uh, in chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians 3, 13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. 
So, G- so Paul has been dropping hints throughout this whole passage, uh, this whole uh, series. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And he's talking about other things, but he just throws that at the end of the sentence. It's kind of like a, a girl who's newly engaged, and she's got this engagement ring on, but she doesn't want to bring attention to it directly. She, she's saying, oh, I just got my nails done. How does it look? Or, oh, look over there. Oh, nothing's over there? Oh, weird. Or, 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 or oh, it's hot in here. Oh. Oh, wow. And then you're just like, did you get engaged? And she's like, yes! That's, that's what we see, Paul. He's been excited to get to this topic. He's been talking about the other things. The other things have been good. But he's been wanting to talk about this topic. And that is Jesus coming back. And that's where we are in this passage. So let's jump right into the message. Um, uh, chapter 4, verse 13. We're going to do 13 through 18. But let's just start with the first verse. The coming of the Lord. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. So this is kind of where the Thessalonians, he got the message from Timothy, and he found out from the Thessalonians that they're kind of uninformed in this way. They're uninformed in what happens to Christian believers who passed away before Jesus came back. Now, this is still early in the Christian church. So uh, they were still expecting, they didn't know when Jesus was coming back. And we're, we're going to get the, into that next week. But at the time, maybe the Thessalonians were thinking, oh no, Christians are passing away before Jesus got back. Are they going to be able to join Jesus in the kingdom? How are they going to go with him if they, they passed away? Like, we're expecting us who are still alive, Jesus is going to show up, we're going to go. But what about our loved ones? What happens to them? And this is just, um, they, they weren't with Paul very long, so they weren't sh- sh- uh, shored up on their theology. They didn't understand the raising of the dead. They knew that Jesus rose from the dead, but they didn't understand what that meant for them and their loved ones that had passed away. So Paul is saying, I don't want you to be uninformed or to grieve as those who have no hope. And this, this is, he, before he explains what's going to happen to the loved ones, that they do have hope, he's acknowledging that if you don't have Jesus, if you don't understand Jesus' resurrection or the resurrection of the dead, then it makes sense that you have no hope. It, we, I have a few examples of some people who are atheists or uh, non-believers or philosophers who just, they don't have the hope of Jesus' return. They don't have the, the hope of rising from the dead. And we, we have a couple of examples of what it looks like these are their final words, or these are reported their final words. Uh, Thomas Hobbes, um, he was a political philosopher. He said, I say again, if I had the whole world at my disposal, I would give it to live one day. I am about to take a deep or a leap into the dark. This is his deathbed final words, reportedly. And what he sees is, if I had the whole world, I just need one more day because that's all I have. I'm going into the dark. I don't know what's ahead of me. And that terror, that fear he he was feeling right before his death um, overwhelmed him. And he would trade everything for one more day. Uh, David uh, Strauss, who was um, a a German rationalist, I I, I believe he was very focused on the historical Jesus, but he didn't buy Jesus was the son of God or the miracles or those kind of things. So his... Uh, final words at his deathbed were, my philosophy leaves me utterly forlorn. I feel like one caught in the merciless jaws of an automatic machine, not knowing at what time one of its great hammers may crush me. And in this theme of hopelessness, this death is coming, there's nothing I can do about it. What, what was the point of my life? Uh, I have no hope. And finally, uh, Anton Levy who uh, wrote the, the uh, Satanic Bible. He completely opposed to Jesus. No hope at all. He, he looks like a Disney villain, the goatee and the, the bald head. He's exactly who I would picture wrote the Satanic Bible. But these were his final words. This is moments before he died. Oh my, oh my, what have I done? There's something wrong. There's something very wrong. There's something very wrong. The terror in that. Could you imagine those being your final words, having no hope? And it sounds like even for him, he might have seen what was coming. He got a vision of the moments before his death of where he was going. And this makes sense. If this is 
All we have in life is this world is all there is, and we're about to go into the dark, and we don't know what's next. Death is terrifying. We don't know what's coming for us. We don't know if it's nothingness or, or terror, as uh, Anton um, viewed. And Paul agrees with, their, um, with how they are approaching death from their worldview. Paul even says in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, um, let's see, yeah, 1 Corinthians 15, 16 through 19, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, they're gone. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. And then it goes on to say a little further in the passage, what do I gain if humanly speaking, I fought with beasts of Ephesus, and if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. This is the worldview that if we don't have hope in Jesus Christ, if we don't have hope in his resurrection, in our resurrection, this world is all we got or, or worse. And Paul is agreeing with those deathbed um, uh, f- phrases, what those guys said on their deathbed, because that was their hope, and what they said made sense. But, but, these are all buts. Paul does have hope. Paul does have faith. And let's go on further into 1 Corinthians 55 through 57. This is our deathbed confession, or not confession, but our, our last words when we do have hope. We look at death in the face and say, oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And then Philippians 1, 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Not only is death, not, only is death not a, a thing to be afraid of, It has no sting. It's better. It's we're looking forward to being face to face with Christ. That we have work to do here on earth as Christians. But when we pass away, we have something amazing to look forward to. It is gain. It's not something terror. It's something that when we face our deathbed, we we are saying, I can't wait. I can't wait to be with Jesus. And that is the, the flip of the worldview in the Christian worldview, that we have hope. We have hope beyond death. So uh, moving on. Um, what do we do with those who don't know this? What do we do with the people in our world who have no hope? who avoid talking about death, but it's inevitable. It's whether you're a believer or not, you know that everyone's going to die. And how do we give them that courage? How do, they may not want to think about that moment before death. They may be putting it off, but eventually they're going to face it. Someone in their family is going to die, or they're going to get that diagnosis, that scary diagnosis, and they come face to face, and they're wondering, what comes next? What hope do I have? And as Christians, we, we have the gospel to share them with them. We have this hope to share with them. And we use this tool here at Crosswinds called the ABCs, Admit, Believe, Choose. Or we have the the Spanish uh, version, the ACEs or ACE. So um, we share this with our worlds. It's an easy way to share the gospel, to share the hope that says there is an afterlife and it's beautiful and glorious, but we we need to uh, admit first. Admit that we are sinners, that we are lost, that we are broken. And I believe all three of those atheist men, they got to this. They admitted that I'm broken, I'm lost, I have no hope, there's nothing I can do. And, and the terror in that is that they didn't get to the next two uh, points. And hopefully we all get to this point, admit, before we get to our deathbeds, or, or before we get a chance to find out about Jesus, that he has a path towards salvation. And that's where the next one comes, believe, creer. We believe that Jesus Christ made a path for us, that he is that hope, that he died on the cross for us so that we could know that when we die, we will join him in heaven, that he made a way, that he 
brought salvation, that he reconciled us to God, that we admitted our sins, and now he has made a way, and finally we choose, or Eleher, we choose to make him our Lord and Savior. We say, okay, I believe Jesus has made a way, and now I'm choosing him to make, choosing to make him my Lord and Savior. And when we share that with others, and they go through that step, and they come to that belief, they say, what they know when they're on their deathbed, they say, I know that Jesus has saved me, and I've chosen to follow him. And when I close my eyes for the last time, I know I will open them again in his presence, and I will be safe and secure. And that's what we share with our worlds. And that's, if that's your first time hearing it here, and you want to know more about that, or you believe that, please, please come up after the service and talk to us. We, we want to we want to share with you in that. We want to hear how you know on your deathbed you won't be saying those awful phrases, that you will say, oh, death, where is your sting? And, um, and to uh, die is Christ, or to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And that is what we are looking for, forward to. So believers have hope. And point two Let's move on to verses 14 through uh, 16. I had it at 14 to 15 before, but I felt like it fit a little better in part two. So correct your notes. It's 14 through 16. So for since, uh, yeah, starting in verse 14. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And that brings us to point two. Believers will rise again. Now, uh, this is where we're starting to get into um, eschatology. And eschatology is the study of end times. This is the study of the dead rising, Jesus' uh, return, uh, the rapture, uh, the millennium, uh, uh, all these different things. And I'm going to uh, make myself next week suffer. I'm going to get into that next week. I'm not going to touch it this week. I really just want to focus. On, and I know some of you are frustrated by that. I know <laughs> some of you are looking forward to see me sweat, but I'm, 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 I'm uh, putting that on future Charlie, and he hates me already. So, um, But hey, that's a plug for next week. So come, come next week. Ah, I gotcha. Okay. But, um, but uh, what I really want to focus on here is we know that Jesus is returning. We know there is, that he's coming back. And we'll get into the timing of that next week. Uh, hint, hint, there is no real timing. But w when he comes back, and we know it is, the dead will rise. The dead who, who died knowing Christ will come back. And that's what the Thessalonians needed to know, that their loved ones that had passed away, and they were wondering what happens to them. Because the Thessalonians, they grew up in a Greek culture, and uh, they had Greek understanding of death. They thought once you were dead, you were gone. You were in Hades or Elysium or, or uh, wherever the Greek mythology. So they, they didn't have an understanding of the resurrection of the dead and what that looked like. But uh, Paul is reminding them that remember that Jesus rose from the dead, and likewise you will too. He was the first fruit uh, of the resurrection, and we too will rise when we die. So take courage in that. Don't be discouraged by that. And he's just, uh, he, he's filling in the gaps of where um, they hadn't learned before. So uh, he when, they, when Jesus returns, the, the second return, and he got that across to them the, in his first travels, they knew that Jesus was coming back. Uh, but he is assuring them, saying, when he comes back, he's bringing all your dead loved ones, the ones who knew Christ, he's bringing them with him. He's bringing their spirits with them. And when he arrives... Uh, they are the first ones that will be resurrected from their dead. Their, their bodies will resurrect from the dead to meet him in the sky. So the dead will rise first. So if you were worried about um, the dead, don't worry. They're in a better position than you. You shouldn't worry about them. You should worry about yourself. Uh, <laughs> you're in the harder place. But they will rise first. They will meet Christ first in the sky. Fall, and then you will uh, follow them afterwards. 
So uh, we also see this in the Old Testament. We see a little more detailed version of this in the Old Testament in Daniel 12, 1 through 3. At that time shall arise Michael, and the great prince who has charge of our, your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. That's the book of life. That's all believers. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your name is in that book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above and those who turn many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. And this is just the encouragement. When Jesus comes back, dead or living in Christ, we will all rise up and meet him in the sky. And there will be a glory in that. We will see Christ's glory face to face and we will... Uh, experience that glory and become that glory ourselves. It says, um, it says here, shine like the brightness of the sky above, like the stars forever and ever. Um, and that's what we have to look forward to, knowing that our loved ones who have passed away, that they're in a good place, they're with Jesus. And not only that, we're going to see them again. We, when Jesus returns, we will be with them. Going on to the, the next uh, part of the passage for point three. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So our third point is believers, all believers, not just the dead, but also the living, will be with Jesus at this point. And Jesus spoke about this himself. It's not just Paul teaching the Thessalonians. Everything Paul teaches the Thessalonians is scripture. It's God-inspired. But Jesus also referred to this in Matthew 24, 31. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. This is just how the passage says, there will be a loud tr uh, trumpet call and everyone will be collected, the living and the dead, all, uh, all around the earth. And also, it, this is the parable of uh, the, the virgins waiting for the bridegroom who are prepared. It, it, it also describes this loud um, proclamation that Jesus is here. But at midnight, there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And that's looking forward to next week's passage where we're, we're keeping an eye out. We're looking for Jesus' return. So this passage is mostly to comfort us, saying that Jesus is returning and that our loved ones will be there. But also keep an eye out. Look for it. Be prepared for it. You won't know the time or the date, but keep an eye out and be prepared for that because there's people in your world that need to be prepared for that as well. They need to know that Jesus is coming and... Our, our, the time is up once he comes. There, there is, uh, there, there's repentance after that if, uh, oh, this is where we're getting weird in the eschatology. Uh, what happens after Jesus returns? But then there's the judgment and there will be no longer time. So we need to be prepared in preparing the people in our lives who need to know Jesus, that he's coming and there's still time, but uh, it's not forever. So, this last part of the, the, the passage here, uh, verse 18, therefore encourage one another with these words. And this is where I, I was thinking, how do I make this a Mother's Day message, or how do I relate it into Mother's Day? And, uh, and God answered my prayer, and it's, it's a painful one, actually. It's a hard one. It's, um, we, we have had many um, mothers pass away recently here at the church. Um, right here, we have a, a wreath for a memorial we had yesterday that was um, one of the mothers in this church, and that was dearly loved. And the encouragement that we have, and this passage was read at her memorial last night, and that's the encouragement we have, is that we know that our loved ones who have passed away, our mothers and everyone else who, who passed away knowing Christ, that they are with him face to face, and that we will see them again. 
So whether you're someone who's lost a mother, and, and this is a hard day for you, or maybe you're a mother who had a miscarriage or, or lost a child, and, and it, that's hard as well, just know that they're with Christ, that they're with Jesus. I, I was reminded by an elder earlier this week that uh, for the mothers who have lost a child, that um, they will come face to face with them in Jesus' return, and they'll meet them for the first time, potentially, and how glorious that will be, how, how fulfilling and, and the, the hurts that, uh, that caused in this world, knowing that they are going to see that child again, and that Jesus loves them so much and loved that child so much that he took them early and kept them uh, for himself to be, so we can meet them in, in eternity when Jesus returns. And how beautiful it is for us to know as Christians that our loved ones are, are, are uh, the ones who knew Christ will be there in heaven uh, and be there in Jesus' second coming to, to meet us and that we can take comfort in that. So this passage says to encourage others with this. And if that's what you're going through, I, I hope it encourages you. The scripture says to rejoice with those who rejoice on Mother's Day, as we're, a lot of us will be going out celebrating and, and loving on our mothers as we should, and, and really, um, really expressing the gift that God has given us with our mothers. And some of us will be mourning, and we mourn with them mourn their loss and love them, but also encourage them with what he has to say in his word, that Jesus has their loved ones in his hand and we will see them again. So our, our final, oh, I, I have one more. So we opened up with uh, some quotes from people who had no hope. And I want to close with some quotes, deathbed quotes uh, that for people who did have hope. What did it look like right before they passed away? What were their final words? We have the great reformer, Martin Luther. His final words were reported as, Our God is the God from whom cometh salvation. God is the Lord by whom we escape death. Richard Baxter, I have pain. And I don't want to skip that. I have pain. He said, this Christian who had hope said, I had pain, but I have peace. I have peace. There is pain in this world. There are people that we lose, the Thessalonians who lose their loved ones, us who lose our loved ones. There is pain in that, but I have peace. I have peace knowing that they, there's hope. They are with Christ and that he himself was, right before he died, he had peace going to meet his Savior. John Knox, uh, live in Christ, die in Christ, and the flesh need not fear death. O oh, death, where is your sting? With that, we'll close with our, um, our, our takeaways. And the first one is, who in my world needs to be informed? Who, do, who needs to know this information? Who does not know what's happening after they pass away? Who, who needs to know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? That there is hope after death? And we have our cards to do that. We pray over it, and we just seek the Lord's calling in that. And when he gives us the opportunity, we can share that with them, saying, hey, there's hope. Death is not the end. There is great joy um, after this, this life for those who believe in Christ. Next is, who will I see again? Uh, and that's just the encouragement part. Think of those you have lost. And think of who you are looking forward to seeing again. In moments of pain and, and uh, sorrow, missing them, remember you will see them again. And maybe those you, it's been a while, and maybe you haven't thought of them in a while. Re- remember them, and remember that they're with Jesus right now. They're in eternal glory and joy, and think that you will see them once again. And finally, how can I comfort those who are mourning? As Many are hurting in our church right now. Many have lost loved ones. And, uh, and today's a hard day in particular for them. How can you comfort them? Maybe it's, it's with these words of encouragement, what the passage says. Maybe it's just giving them space and sending them a text saying, hey, I'm thinking of you, I'm praying for you. Or maybe it's taking them out to coffee and just hearing them out and re- having good memories of the one they lost or, or the hopes and dreams um, that are hard on the, that they lost, uh, that's difficult. 
and just be praying about how, as a church, we're here to love and comfort each other. We want to celebrate Mother's Day, and we also want to acknowledge those who are hurting today. So uh, be praying about that. And, and if you need comfort too, our elders will be up front uh, after the service. Please ask them for prayer. Maybe this is a, a hard day for you, and we want to pray for you. We, we want to share God's love with you. We want to let you know that we're here for you. And I encourage you to come up front after the service. With that, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word, Lord. I thank you for the hope it offers uh, us in this dying world, Lord. As we all face death, Lord, that we know that there's, there's an eternal life to be spent with you for us who believe in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that we would share that hope and that joy with others who need to hear it, Lord. The, those who do not, um, have not faced mortality, their own mortality yet, Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes and see that they need something more, something more solid, that um, philosophies of this world will not get them past uh, death, Lord. Only you can do that. So I pray that you would um, give us wisdom and knowledge as we go into our worlds, as we love our church, Lord. And I pray that you would just bless uh, this day as we celebrate our mothers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, his wife just passed away, and her memorial is next Sunday at 4 o'clock here at the church. So I encourage you all to attend. Um, she was a mother uh, that we all dearly loved, a spiritual mother as well. So I encourage you all to attend, and let's mourn with those who mourn and encourage uh, the family members. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that message of anticipation. Are we ready? Are you ready to see the Lord? All of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, path for the Lord. Jesus is God. sinners, wake up the saints, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Are we ready? Like a bride waiting for the groom, we'll be a church ready for you.
I'm getting you out early today. This is nice. Well, that's all, all purely intentional, so you can all celebrate Mother's Day. We have uh, chocolate out front and, and uh, flowers, and be sure to take pictures with your mother at the photo booth. I'll close this in prayer, and we can go celebrate our mothers. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day, Lord. We thank you for the power of your word, Lord. I, I, I pray that it brings comfort and encouragement, Lord, and I pray that we would all go out here um, feeling your love and knowing that you are coming back. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Happy Mother's Day.